In celebration of Women's History Month, this episode of This Week in Royal History will exclusively highlight remarkable women. During this special month, we will not only recognize the birthdays and commemorate the deaths of these women, but also delve into their inspiring life stories and significant contributions to history. Get ready to learn about some truly amazing figures. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. In the summer of 1651, a child was born to the Spanish monarchs Philip IV and Mariana of Austria. This child, Margaret Teresa of Spain, arrived into a world of great privilege and expectation, but also of familial complexity, as her parents were uncle and niece. Margaret Teresa had a younger brother, Charles II, who would later become the last Spanish Habsburg ruler. Mary Teresa's life would take a momentous turn in April of 1666, when she married by proxy to Leopold I, Holy Roman Emperor. This union was made all the more remarkable by the fact that Leopold was both her maternal uncle and her paternal cousin. Margaret Teresa traveled to Vienna that December to formalize her marriage, which was celebrated with great fanfare. Despite the initial excitement surrounding their marriage, Margaret Teresa and Leopold's union was marred by tragedy. Although they had four children together, only one daughter survived to adulthood. Margaret Teresa's own life was tragically cut short at the age of 21, when she contracted bronchitis while pregnant. Her final resting place was at the Imperial Crypt in Vienna, a solemn testament of her status as royalty. Even as a child in Spain, Margaret Teresa was already attracting the attention of the greatest artists of her time. The renowned painter Diego Velazquez, a master of the Baroque period, immortalized her in many of his works. Perhaps the most famous of these, Las Meninas, in which Margaret Teresa appears as a little girl, surrounded by her attendants and a mysterious painter in the background. Through Velazquez's art, Margaret Teresa's legacy lives on, capturing a moment in time that still captivates art lovers to this day. On the 12th of March, 1637, Anne, the firstborn of Edward Hyde, the first Earl of Clarendon, and Francis Aylesbury, was brought into the world at Cranbourne Lodge in Windsor. Her birth coincided with a period of great upheaval in English history, as Charles I of England had been deposed and executed in 1649. Consequently, Anne and her family were forced to flee to the Netherlands. After settling in the Netherlands, Anne secured a position as a maid of honor to marry Princess of Orange and Princess Royal. The monarchy was restored in September 1660, and Anne married James, Duke of York, the brother of Charles II of England, in a private ceremony. At the time of their marriage, Anne was pregnant, and the couple's first child was born two months later. Despite the birth of seven more children, only two daughters survived to adulthood. Although Anne was raised in the Anglican faith, she underwent a conversion to Catholicism and became instrumental in James's own conversion around 1669. Sadly, Anne's life was cut short at the tender age of 34, and she passed away on the 31st of March, 1671. Her remains were interred in the vault of Mary Queen of Scots at Westminster Abbey. It is worth noting that both of Anne's surviving daughters, Mary and Anne, ascended to the throne as Queen of England, becoming the last Stuart monarchs. This interesting fact highlights the enduring legacy of Anne's life, despite her untimely death. Matilda of Ringelheim a remarkable figure in medieval Europe, graced the world with her presence sometime around the year 892. 
Despite having half-siblings from her father's previous marriage, Matilda was the only child of the Saxon Count Dietrich of Ringelheim and Reinhild, and thus inherited a significant burden of responsibility. In the year 909, Matilda was united in marriage with Henry, Duke of Saxony, and the couple went on to raise five children, who all lived to reach adulthood. Upon her husband's accession as the first non-Frankish king of East Francia, Matilda was crowned as the German queen in 912. Throughout her time in this role, she dedicated her attention to the women's monasteries of the realm, recognizing their potential as centers of learning, prayer, and influence. Indeed, her tireless efforts in this regard culminated in her founding of the renowned Quedlinburg Abbey, which she eventually made her home after the passing of her beloved Henry in 936. As a true visionary, Matilda continued to establish convents across the territory throughout her life, shaping the spiritual landscape of the region for generations to come. She passed away on the 14th of March in 968, having lived to the impressive age of around 76 years old. Her immense contributions to the religious and political life of the time were so widely recognized that she was eventually venerated as a saint, and her feast day is celebrated to this day on the 14th of March. It is worth noting that the influence of Quedlinburg Abbey extended beyond the confines of the religious sphere. Indeed, noble families recognized the importance of the institution and would send their daughters to be raised there, grooming them for positions of power as abbesses. With a seat at the imperial diet, the abbess of Quedlinburg held considerable sway in the East Franconian Empire, ensuring the continuation of her family's influence for generations to come. All in all, Matilda's life and legacy offer a shining example of the power of dedication, vision, and tireless works toward a greater cause. On the 15th of March, 1275, a new member was added to the esteemed Plantagenet lineage. As Margaret Plantagenet was born to the illustrious Edward I of England and his wife, Eleanor of Castile within the storied walls of Windsor Castle. As the tenth of fifteen children, Margaret was raised amidst the pomp and circumstance of royal life, a fitting environment for a young woman of such noble birth. Betrothed since 1278, Margaret's destiny was forever entwined with that of John II, Duke of Brabant, whom she wed in a lavish ceremony at Westminster Abbey in July of 1290. Despite their shared station, however, their union was plagued by strife and unhappiness. John was notorious for his many mistresses that he kept at court and with whom he fathered numerous illegitimate children. Despite this, Margaret bore him one son in 1300, who was raised alongside his half-siblings. In a gesture of forward thinking, John signed the Charter of Cortenberg in 1312, paving the way for a peaceful transfer of power to his son upon his death. Tragically, this was not to be, as John passed away the same year, leaving Margaret to pick up the pieces and forge ahead without her wayward husband. Margaret lived a long and eventful life, outliving all 18 of her siblings and half-siblings, and passing away sometime around the year 1333. She was interred at the Cathedral of St. Michael and St. Gudula in Brussels, her final resting place, a testament to the regal life that she had lived. It's worth noting that while Margaret's life was not without its challenges, her longevity was a true marvel. Indeed, as the longest living child of Edward I, her time on this earth exceeded that of all of her siblings and half-siblings a testament to the resilience and fortitude of the Plantagenet line. Anne Neville's life was one of grandeur and tragedy, her story forever intertwined with the turbulent politics of the Wars of the Roses. Born on the 11th of June, 1456, Anne was the daughter of Richard Neville, 16th Earl of Warwick, 
and a man known as the Kingmaker for his important support of the House of York during the conflict. Her father's power was legendary, and his influence helped secure the throne for Edward IV in 1461. Anne's older sister, Isabel, further cemented the family's position when she married the king's brother, George, Duke of Clarence, in 1469. However, the tide of war would soon turn, and by 1470, Anne's father had changed allegiance to the Lancastrians, fleeing to France with his daughters and son-in-law to join the exiled queen consort, Margaret of Anjou. It was through her marriage to Edward of Westminster, son of Margaret of Anjou, and the imprisoned King Henry VI, that Anne would first taste the fruits of royalty. By the time of their union, her father had already restored Henry VI to the English throne, though his restoration was brief. Richard Neville was killed in battle in April 1471, and Henry VI was taken prisoner and subsequently died just a month later. Undeterred by these losses, Anne and her family continued to fight for the Lancastrian cause, only to suffer further tragedy at the Battle of Tewkesbury, when her husband, Prince Edward, was killed and Anne was taken a prisoner. Her imprisonment was a difficult time, but she was eventually reunited with her sister and brother-in-law. In 1472, Anne married Richard, Duke of Gloucester, the younger brother of Edward IV and George, Duke of Clarence. The union bore fruit when Anne gave birth to a son, Edward, sometime between 1473 and 76. When Edward IV died in April of 1483, Richard became Lord Protector of his young nephew, Edward V, who was later declared illegitimate and Richard claimed the throne as Richard III. Anne and Richard were jointly crowned on the 6th of July, 1483. But tragedy was never far away from Anne's life, as she was deeply affected by the death of her son in April, 1484. Her own passing came just a year later, on the 16th of March, 1485, just five months before her husband was killed at the Battle of Bosworth. Her story is one of triumph, tragedy, love, and loss, and stands as a testament to the indomitable spirit of one of England's most fascinating queens. And with that, we wrap up this edition of This Week in Royal History. It was truly a pleasure to share with you the captivating stories of these women from royal history. I hope you found this episode both informative and enjoyable. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Rebecca Larson. Stay curious and keep exploring the fascinating world of royal history. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.